Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our webinar featuring the wonderful and talented Ms. Pamela Barnum. Where we're going to talk about how to build digital trust. We're so excited to have her on today where she's going to give you practical tips and techniques for how you can build trust digitally and also some pretty cool lessons on body language, both in person and virtually. In the meantime, I did want to let you know about a really cool course that Pam has available. If you go to her website, PamelaBarnum.com, she has an online course called Trust Hack. And in that course, you can take it and learn more about what we're talking today, whether that be body language, building trust, or building trust digitally, and leadership. It's a really amazing course. It's broken down into snippets of about seven to eight minutes a piece, so it can be taken on your timetable at your leisure. It's a really great way, great way to learn more about Pam as well as her content. So we're going to continue to wait for another couple minutes, and, excuse me, another couple seconds, and then we'll bring Pam on, Pam on to get going. So again, thank you very much for taking some time out of your day to join us and be here. Uh, we're very excited about being here in our new uh, virtual studio that we can showcase our speakers, as well as topics we think are going to bring value to you in this new crazy digital world that uh, we're continuing to evolve into. So that's good. Uh, big special thanks to my producer, Alex Suddeth, who's amazing. So thank you for that. As well as a big thank you to uh, Executive Speakers Bureau for giving us this space as well too. So I think that we're good. And without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and bring Pam on. So Pam is a former undercover police officer, federal prosecuting attorney, and has studied graduate work based around negotiations as well as trust. Pam spends her time researching and talking about trust, body language, and what we can do as leaders and as individuals to be more trusting and trustworthy people. So Pam, how are you doing today? I'm doing amazing, Stephen. Thank you so much. And you know, it's interesting, we're getting used to all of this virtual stuff. So my brain is telling me I'm actually there with you right now. So it's- Well, uh, I feel like you're here with me, which is good, exactly. right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's really cool. So how's Canada today? Canada is amazing. It's uh, beautiful. The weather, of course, we're going into autumn. I live in the Rocky Mountains, so there's snow. We've had some snow. Of course. Of course, up in the mountains. Now, that's why we live here. We love it. I know maybe for you, that's, that's a detractor from this area. Snow scares me. I'm not going to lie. I'm scared of snow <laughs> because it's cold. I don't like cold. So. It's very cold. Just going to be upfront and honest with that. You know, this is about trust, so I want to be trustworthy and, and be honest. So. Well, Everyone appreciates that for sure. But if you ever get the chance, I have to say, if you've seen pictures of Lake Louise, Banff area, that's my backyard. So I'm very fortunate to be here. I've seen pictures of Banff from the, uh, you know, the 90 degree temperatures from my uh, front porch. And I'm good with that. <laughs> it's beautiful, but you know, I'll take that. Hey, so quick question for you. I feel like the, t the weather in Canada is about 30 degrees Fahrenheit all year round. Is that, is that true? Or that's just it's not true. If it, we have we have a couple of seasons. We have summer, construction, and winter. And oh. three, like, that's not construction. It. Talk about this construction time. I've never heard it referred to as construction. Well, well, I've been to Atlanta. You guys have. There's that season exists in Atlanta as well. Everything's the roads are under construction nonstop. There's traffic yes. no matter what time of the day or night in the bigger cities. In my little town of five thousand people, uh, not so much. Not so much. Well, that's good. That's good. Hey, so you want to talk about trust? I'm talking about trust. Let's talk and about how trust. how important is that? It's always been important, but it seems to be a spotlight right now. That's for sure. Well, I think it is. So let's start with this. So, I mean, talk about kind of your journey and like, why trust? Like, like when did trust start becoming something important to you? I think it started when I was working as an undercover police officer in the drug unit. So for me, building trust uh, was life or death. And it was okay. fairly important on a day-to-day -day yes. basis because if the people I was dealing with didn't trust me, uh, trust is the currency for every interaction. And it's probably really apparent in the drug world because if you don't have it, nothing happens. And of course, safety is an issue. So that I really started focusing on that. And it wasn't always what we said because mm -hmm. nine times out of 10, you're not getting the truth. So you had to be able to watch and be more of an active observer as well as being an active listener. And then when I became a federal prosecuting attorney, we call them federal crown attorneys here in Canada, but like you're a district attorney for the federal government. Sure. I did that job. Um, and really those skills came into play all as much. Now, of course, 
it was rarely a safety issue. It was all about justice, the truth, mm -hmm. and having everything out so that the facts could be presented and people could make decisions around that. So it was really important because someone's um, jeopardy, there was, you know, whether or not they were mm -hmm. going to go to jail, is really important. Mm -hmm. And also when you take into account the victims and communities. So there was, you know, an extra level of importance around trust. And so I was going to graduate school after law school and studied negotiations and trust is the foundation for every negotiation. So it just seemed that that theme kept showing up, kept showing up. And I was talking about it. People were asking more. And here we are today with the Executive Speakers Bureau talking about trust. Hey, so I got a question for you on that. So you say that trust is the, uh, the foundation of all negotiations. Kind of unpack that a little bit. How, how is trust kind of the foundation of all negotiations? Well, we'll do deals um, with people we trust and we'll risk a lot with people we trust. Mm -hmm. We don't always take that step with people we like. We like people. If we don't trust them, we're really not interested in going into business or having a relationship with that person, at least not one that's effective and useful for everyone involved. The same thing for, you know, how we raise our kids as parents, we need to have a trust in our kids. That's something that we cherish, you know, above and beyond everything else is trust in our own personal relationships. So when you take a look at everything else that goes in, whether you know someone, we hear that no like trust. And I think mm -hmm. no and like are always important. And they're, in my opinion, bonuses. But if trust is absent, you can trust someone and not like them necessarily, but still have a great business relationship because sure. you know that they're going to honor what they say. They're going to come through with the commitments that they've made. They have integrity. And these are all parts of trust. And really, as we talk a little bit more, Stephen, my position and the research and field tested experience points to trust really exists at the crossroads of empathy and confidence, at least from a mm. personal perspective, when you're building trust, if you have those things, of course, competence, knowledge, experience, all of those things really add the layers to confidence. And when we can exhibit those things with our nonverbals, with our body language, it really takes the next step as far as building trust. And especially for people who are doing a lot of online things now. Yeah, hundred percent. So I want to talk, uh, take a little bit different. So you talked about empathy and how important empathy was, but I want to bring in a different word, fear. Uh, oh. you know, cause I think there's a lot of fear just in society, in the world today. Um, and I think too, the digital world can lend itself to fear because we are digital and we're a little more separate and we can't see or observe things as much as we can when we're in person. Talk to me about how fear just kind of plays into this as well. Yeah, we see when there's research done on trust and there's actually something called the Edelman Trust Index and they go across the globe and do polling with thousands of people around their trust levels for government, NGOs, corporations, relationships, et cetera. And what they found consistently is that when fear increases, of course, trust correspondingly decreases. So in our current situation, when we have, when we're in the middle of a pandemic and there's economic uncertainty and there's political uncertainty and civil unrest, all of that feeds each other for this fear. And we're so concerned that we don't know what's going to happen next. So when we don't have that certainty, fear, of course, increases and our ability to trust decreases significantly. And we're getting our information. Maybe we're not being as open to different ideas. Um, social media plays such an enormous role. And of course, now there's a lot of focus on social media and there's, you know, documentaries around how all of us can be manipulated by the things that we see and read online. And there's not a lot of filters there and it's, it's just feeding that fear. So if people don't have hope about the future and when they do studies on trust, we talk about the future, where do you see yourself or your family in five years? If things are bad right now, but people believe that things can be better, mm -hmm. then trust is increased because we're, we're trusting that if we take these steps, things will get better. But if right. we're encased in fear, then we don't believe that the future can be better. And we start making decisions based on fear instead of on, on trust and foundations and relationships. Yeah, that's really cool. So <clears throat> you do a lot of consulting with leaders um, and just kind of how to build trust. So crazy digital world, things change, things up in it about six months ago, and you've got to move. I, I don't want to say move, maybe add a layer 
or add a, add a new way of thinking of, okay, so I'm a leader. My whole team is remote. I'm not seeing them, but they still have to trust me. And especially during a time of incredible uncertainty and not knowing a lot of courses that we can plot, what are some of the things that you go and discuss with leaders day one where they bring you in to say, hey, help me to build trust digitally? What can I do? So the first thing is to just really be authentic. And I know that virtual backgrounds are really popular. In fact, I just did a presentation this past week for the Canadian Association of Professional Speakers, one of their chapters. And when I logged in, I would say 80 plus percent had a virtual background. Mm -hmm. And it's problematic. And we want to think that it's okay to have this virtual background because it looks so good. You know, we have uh, the Golden Gate Bridge or we have, you know, all of these different things. I have yeah, well, you have a real background. I can tell that that's a screen and you're not trying to hide the fact that it's a screen because um, here's the thing. Right now we're in my home office sure. and I could do a million things with my home office and I could put, you know, this professional green screen and I could make whatever I want to appear appear behind me and that's great. But here's what happens subconsciously for people because of the way our brains work. And this is really important that when I log into something or I'm having a conversation with you in person, it's authentic because we're in surroundings together. When, when it's virtual, I'm exposing and being vulnerable to you. And mm. if there is something artificial happening behind you, then subconsciously I'm wondering, okay, first of all, I feel a little bit disrespected because now I'm sharing and I'm not having something shared back. And Brene Brown has a whole body of research around that, around vulnerability. And then the other part is, I wonder what else he's hiding. So is there oh, something interesting. else? Now, now I've got this little clue. And believe it or not, Tiger King, when all of this happened, this was the most popular virtual background that people have. That's <laughs> so great. <laughs> Alex, can we get that? <laughs> Please, for our next one. Oh, that was awesome. It, and, and, but here's the proviso. So if you are an expert or you're a leader in your mm -hmm. company and you're branding for your company or association or you're presenting for a company or association mm -hmm. and you are, have a professional background, a professional green screen that's properly lit and you have a high definition photograph that you can upload as the virtual background that makes sense for that particular circumstance, I say, absolutely. So sure. that's my proviso to that. You don't have to keep it real all the time, mm -hmm. but you, if, if everyone has that same background, we've all been to conferences recently where the branding is really important. All the speakers mm -hmm. have the same background and everything is uniform. I think amazing. But for most leaders that are doing virtual meetings now that would have perhaps happened in the boardroom or somewhere else, bring your real self to that meeting and the research tells us that the trust is increased. So now what you say is more believable, more trusted, likely to be acted on. Yeah. Okay. So I'm fascinated. I mean, how else we build trust? I mean, you, you've got me with one. What, what else you got? Well, how our nonverbal show up. So our brain tells us within 50 milliseconds, whether or not friend or foe. So if I log in and now you've just seen my face, everyone who logged in first 50 minutes, that's less than a blink of an eye. I either like her or I don't like her. Mm. And that's just how we've evolved. Now, in the next seven seconds, I start looking for reasons to justify that initial reaction. So mm. I may really hate trees and now I see trees in her background or I wonder what that plaque is all about. And there's some things going on and I'm trying to you know, rationalize why I made that decision. Same when you walk onto stage or walk in front of a room or connect with your employees or your customers and they come in, there's that immediate reaction. There are things we can do to flip that a little bit and so that we can increase our chance of being seen as friend and then giving people reasons to build on that initial opinion. And of course, the first one is expressing empathy with our body language. And mm -hmm. how do we do that? There's a number of different ways, but I'll give you some easy ones. And the first one is to have this really open stance. How often do we see people who come into a room or stand up and they cross their arms? 
And you know, while we're on that, for all the realtors out there, I have no idea why this became a popular realtor pose on their business cards and on park benches. <laughs> it just, it's, people perceive it as closed off, even though it is not. They could be cold. They could be trying to pump up their biceps sure. because they've been working out. There could be a million reasons why they are crossing their arms. But when I've done research and then I've read research on this arm cross, people automatically perceive it. And I, I usually play a game at the beginning of presentations where I go through all of these different photos and I ask people, okay, which one is more likely to be confident? Which one is more like, and so yeah. we get, and consistently when people see the closed arms, they think that that person is- Do you have an example off. of the game? Uh, oh yes, I have a yeah. great example. I, I want to play. I've got this um, amazing guy here who's posed for some pictures and here's here's what i'm talking about so if you can see the gentleman in a he's smiling he right. looks engaged um and the gentleman in b his arms are uncrossed but he has a bit of a smirk on his face so which appears more open to your ideas believe it or not you know contrary to the things we've just been talking about it's going to be a because we're going to be looking at his face so that's mm -hmm. where everybody looks to begin with so we all okay so, so, so i was going to ask so people look at the face first before they look at the body language they look at the face first i and mean the face as opposed to like the rest of the body 100 percent. so we're okay. registering micro expressions we're registering expressions on the face um and we look to that first and then we start moving down and that's just okay. natural so a little tip for um presenters who are doing a lot of virtual i'll give you that same slide here in the screen, if I'm presenting this, I always want to be to the left of the viewer's left of okay. what I'm presenting. Because the number one thing that people look to is the human face. And study after study tells us that regardless of culture. So it doesn't matter East, West. That's interesting. Or so in Western cultures where we read left to right, Mm -hmm. We want to have the human face always on the left regardless because that's where people go first and then they're going to go and look at what we're talking about. And it feels awkward unless you're in a culture where people uh, read the reverse, uh, mm -hmm. where they read right to left, then you're going to switch that because you want people to go to the human face first because they're going to be searching for that in their subconscious and how they read is how we want to present because it's easier so they're able to absorb the information easier and you're seen as more credible because you're making it easier on your audience okay so that, that was a lot there's a lot to take in i mean there's a lot of good information i was like wow that's 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 a lot it is it is and it's just you know the but easiest it's cool but i mean but like i mean it's it's easy stuff you would never think of but once you say it like it makes sense it, it makes sense. And when you look at how our brain processes things, that's really what our goal is as leaders, as presenters, as parents, as people in relationships. We want to make what we're saying as easy to digest and memorable as possible. And here's another interesting thing, Stephen, for people that are doing presentations. And we've all okay. been to those presentations where it's really text heavy. There's a lot going on and it's probably all very important. I did a presentation for some engineers and engineers love the data. Give me the data. Love the, data. Love the content. No fluff. They mental, just want the content. Yeah. Mental gymnastics happening. All of that's going on. Sure. So they think that because that's how they learn, that that's how people are going to absorb the information, but it's not. There's a reason why Phone numbers are seven digits, usually aside from the area code or what, you know, and I, mm -hmm. I'm a child of the eighties. So that Jenny eight, six, seven, five, three Oh nine, I will never forget that phone number. As long as I yeah. can still sing it, I would, if I could for you here, but it's, can you see, I mean, Hey, I can, I can pull it up on iTunes if you want to sing it for us really quick. <laughs> we remember all of those things. So having more than seven pieces of information on a slide or on a visual presentation of any sort will not be memorable and in fact there's a ted talk and i'll remember his name and if anybody wants it, i'll find it before the end that he he did some research around this he's a gentleman out of the uk talks about communication that there's a 500 percent increase in retention if there's seven or fewer pieces of information in our visual presentation 
So I take that to heart. Usually my presentations are either a photograph or a word. Mm -hmm. And the reason I, we've all taught, heard about you know, death by PowerPoint and all of those types of cliches, but here's the thing. A visual representation is more memorable than not. And I'll give you some research to back that up. Within okay. 72 hours, if all I've seen is a talking head or I've just been listening. Now, of course, TED Talks are different. They've done research to show 18 minutes is great retention. And even those have mm -hmm. some visual representations. But mm -hmm. if we're doing a longer presentation. If we don't use any visual aids, the retention is 10% of the information we've disclosed is retained over 72 hours. If we mm -hmm. include a visual anchor in the information that we've presented, it increases to 65% retention over 72 hours. So I know that everyone who's being a part of the Executive Speakers Bureau, Bureau community wants their information to be retained by their participants, by their mm -hmm. audiences for as long as possible because they want them to take action on the material that was presented right. to them. We actually have a speaker who's uh, tuning in right now. He said, I got to leave and change all my slides. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's so, imp and these are things we don't think about. And no, never. I would never, uh, th the other thing I want to just emphasize, Stephen, is all of the information I'm going to give you are actually, it's not Google research, it's actual peer reviewed journal books by people with you know every letter so you didn't just go to wikipedia and just say like, i don't oh. use wikipedia no i'm uh i'm not that kind of gal i spend way too much money on subscriptions to academic journals wait i wish i was back in university because i could get all that for free but i have to actually buy it now that's kind of a bummer i know Should that is kind of a bummer hey so that. i want to go back um you know, and talk a little bit about what we can do. I mean, and this is going to take back from, go back from leaders, just kind of all of us, but like, what are some things that we can do practically to, to um, <clears throat> increase trust? Like, how can we become more trustworthy people? Definitely, you know, aside from the obvious, which is honoring your word and showing up and doing the things that you said, I think the majority is our nonverbals, what we do that is unspoken, because mm -hmm. Again, the research tells us that more than 50% of what we are communicating is with our body language and our nonverbal. So how we dress, how our, we show up in our room, all of those things, of course, and then how we carry ourselves. The first thing is posture. Believe it or not, it seems so simple. But think, and I would love everyone as you're meeting with people either online or in person, pay really close attention to how you feel about that person and dissect it as far as, their body, as far as their posture goes. So when someone is sitting upright or they're standing upright with a great stance, which means their feet are approximately shoulder width apart, which indicates steadiness and reliability on that person's part, squared shoulders, and just have that open posture where their, their hands are out in front a little bit or at least down by their side so that we're open, we're not blocking anything. Those are sending messages to the person receiving them that I'm trustworthy. And now mm -hmm. I may have done some things that are contradictory to that, but let me give you an example. When I was a police officer and I would investigate and interview uh, suspects, mm -hmm. Paying attention to their body language provided so much more information because, again, the likelihood of receiving the, the truth verbally. The truth, was, yeah. And also for witnesses, the recall of information for them can be really challenging. So to watch how their body reacts sent me a lot of information about trust. And, and of course, then there's the, the flip side of that, which is deception and some things to look mm -hmm. for as far as deception. And I can give you a couple of those. If yeah, come like. on. No, okay. no, I always want to hear it. I was right. really interesting. People are like, how to tell if someone's lying to you. So that's really cool. I want to hear it. Well, here's, the, I want to tell you first off, there's no such thing as a human lie detector. So if anyone tells you that that's what they are, or they promote a book that says that, right. the data, the research, my experience, all it's can't be, imagine if we had that, then we would just put people up and get that human lie detector to talk to them. And we'd know everything. We'd know the truth. Sure. It doesn't work like that. 
it works in clusters and of course experience with that person. So the longer the amount of time you have with that person, because think about your own relationships. You would know when your spouse or partner is being dishonest with you. Usually there's, you may not cognitively see it, but there are those little signs that you're like, I don't know if I believe that she uh, cooked that herself. You know, that's something my husband probably asks himself. I'm not sure that that's accurate based on the information I've had up until this point. So we're, here are some things we're going to look for there and they have to be two or more in a cluster in order for us to have that little check that goes, okay, I need to investigate further. All of the things around deception only point to the fact that you need to dig deeper and get more fact, more information, more evidence to back up where you're at. You cannot make a definitive decision just based on a few deception clusters. So the first one, which is so easy, and this is easy, really simple to watch for, you can probably see a million videos of it on YouTube, is when your nonverbal and your verbal are out of alignment. So if someone okay. says, I did not steal that cake, and they're shaking their head, no, okay, great. I did not take that cake. And they're nodding yes. Now that seems really obvious, and it can be really yeah. a small head nod, a small head shake. So it, or a shrug, if they if they know something, but they're telling you and you see that shrug, which usually indicates, I don't know. So when you see a verbal message that is out of alignment with the nonverbal, definitely a huge flag should go up. The next one, this may seem like a verbal, but it's actually a nonverbal cue, is that when you ask someone a question and they take more than five seconds to begin their answer, or they begin their answer oh, that's interesting. by by repeating the question or by buying more time. That was always a cue. When I was cross-examining someone, if that happened, now, of course, there's recall issues. You know, where sure. were you Christmas 1997? It's gonna take you probably more than five seconds to answer that. Did you rob that bank? Mm -hmm. So depending again on the stimulus, which is the question sure. or the evidence presented, so a photograph or something, depending on what that stimulus is, and what the stakes are, the length of time that it takes to answer is another significant cue, as is moving our anchor positions. So if any of you watching want to interrogate someone, here is how I would do it. You give them a chair that has rollers on it, casters on it. This is something police officers do all the time so that, and you remove distractions. Right. So that you can see their entire body, they're not standing, they're sitting. And if their hands are placed, you know, on the chair, their feet are anchored on the ground and they start wrapping their feet around the chair or they start moving the chair, there's an amazing interview. I, I did a presentation for the Global Fraud Association and one of the FBI officers reached out to me after and said, you know, you're Canadian, you must know the interviewer who interviewed, we had a series of unfortunate uh, things happen on a military base here. And this interview is famous and they actually use it now in FBI interrogations. And just to watch questions came and how the individual moved in the chair and all of the things that happened after the stimulus of the evidence being presented was so insightful. And it actually led mm -hmm. to the confession because they knew, okay, he's moving, he's doing this, I need to get to this next question, to this next question. So if you're having an important conversation with a staff member or a colleague, um, and you want to watch for deception cues, the chair with the rollers on is the best. The chair with the rollers on is the best. And so if they move around, you know, they're lying. Well, you, you watch for a difference. You, you watch their baseline. So the longer you spend with someone, the more of a baseline you will establish. They may be a fidgety person who's always sure. rolling around and doing things. And then all of a sudden you ask them a question and they stop and they mm -hmm. freeze. That's another mm -hmm. cue, the freeze moment. Yeah. Another yeah. cue. All right, Pam. So we're just about out of time. This has flown by. I can't believe it's flown by. Um, but I want to end on this question. So talking about digitally, talking about digital setups, talking about how leaders can portray digital trust, what would be kind of your parting thought to everyone of saying, hey, on Zoom, on digital, what are the three things I would always think about as far as if you want to be trustworthy, 
before you hop on that call or before you hop on that, you know, whatever, Zoomcast? 100% eye contact would be my first one. I know it seems awkward and strange. The research tells us when we're in person with someone, 60 to 70% of eye contact, any more than that, it can be creepy and aggressive. Any less, it seems evasive and dishonest. Sure. However, when we're on a virtual, it increases to over 90%. So we need to make more eye contact virtually, especially in those meetings where we have several people that we can see, perhaps on a Zoom meeting where there's all mm -hmm. of those different squares, 30 or 40 people you're looking at. It's tempting to go, oh, Stephen, what are you, you know, and Jane's over here and mm -hmm. I'm looking around, mm -hmm. but it looks like I'm looking around. I have to always look at the camera and I have to really practice doing that because it feels unnatural. So putting yeah. a little picture up beside your webcam or having a word or a sticky note with a smiley face goes a long way. So the first one would definitely be increased eye contact. It feels weird, but it looks great. Another one so obvious, lighting. If I can't see your face and I can't see what's going on, we've all been on those meetings where the person looks like they're just about to jump out of a horror film because you can only see half of them or it's super dark. You don't know what's going right. on. Right. <clears throat> I'm, 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 I'm guilty of that. <laughs> <laughs> Diminishes trust. And, and the third thing, we talked a little bit about virtual backgrounds, but when we're keeping it real backgrounds, please keep it real tidy. You know, channel your inner Marie Kondo or something, keep, remove distractions. If you have this really uh, unusual collection of Yodas or something, and you want to be taken seriously as, uh, as you're speaking about innovation, for example, or you're speaking sure. about leadership, you know, maybe someone's triggered by Yoda and they don't like it. So try to be- Maybe you just have one Yoda instead of 10. You, you could, yes. Yeah. So have- <laughs> Be really aware, or I've been on meetings where someone's had the competitor's product in the background inadvertently. So oh, that's crazy. It is crazy. And it's happened. See? Oh, and gosh. people without their pants on. There was a Good Morning yeah, America show with um, Christopher Reeves' never son. Recommend that. His pants. Uh, people, are gonna, people can see those things, even though you don't feel it. And I guess just a little bonus one is dressing like you actually would be showing up to that meeting live. Because oh, that's a good been, one. Taking a shower and dressing appropriately. Dressing like you are going to be there in person because it sends a message to your brain that you're professional, you're confident. And of mm -hmm. course, if anyone hasn't seen Amy Cuddy's TED Talk on the power pose, please do that as soon as possible. She's incredible. Harvard researcher, you know, the Wonder Woman Superman pose sends, increases our testosterone, lowers our cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And really that confidence comes out in our body language. Even if we're not feeling it, we can convince ourselves of that just by doing a simple move. I love it. I love it. Pam, thank you so much for your time and your expertise and your wisdom and your experience for sharing with us. It was amazing. So thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our participants out there for joining us. I uh, hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Uh, if you want more information on Pam or want her to come speak, consult or do a digital uh, training for your company organization or association, go to our website, www.executivespeakers.com. And you can search Pam Barnum for all the information that you need from Pam. Pam, thanks so much. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And I hope things in Canada continue to be amazing. Thank you, Stephen. Stay warm. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye, everyone. Have a good rest of your day.